here we are. <laughs> in the same room. We're in the same room. Woo! She is in the inner sanctum. She is the only person except for us so far that's really allowed in our house. Besides the masked floor people who come down to look at our <laughs> our basement post-flood, which yeah. is another story. We're going to be talking about how fear and empathy interact. And specifically how fear counteracts yeah. empathy. Yeah. So we kind of took a little neurological, scientific swim in the stuff. And... You know, we've talked a lot about fear being this core central thing that lives in our little primitive little reptilian brain down here, that right back here at the base of our sp top of our spinal cord, right down here, and how it drives the fight or flight, and how it's a survival mechanism that dates back to when we were still, you know, just amoeba. Well, maybe not amoeba. Living along the fishies, and you know, it's it's really hard to stop. You wanted to see how long it would take you to notice I was doing that. So it's really hard to turn off the fear. And we've talked a lot about this and ways to disrupt the fear and counteract the fear and deal with the fear you feel because it is a primitive gut foundational emotion and impulse in animals and in humans. Um, so fear is really strong. Fight or flight is really strong. Where does empathy come in? I think to be most effective in helping someone else, the more you can get a sense of what they're feeling in terms of relate to it, mm -hmm. connect to it, the better I think you can come up with ideas of how to alleviate their suffering. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm assuming, because I don't, I don't even know if we you did this or not, I'm assuming as a survival mechanism to help the species continue, it made sense that we could have some connection and understanding of each other's fear or distress so we could help each other alleviate it and survive longer. You're absolutely right because even though we're hardwired for fear, it turns out that neurologically and developmentally and evolutionarily we are hardwired for empathy as well. And those two are always having this tug of war. And especially in situations where they're is uh, you know, a trauma or something happening in front of us. You know, the fear is there wanting us to either fight or flee. And then you know there's the empathy there, caring about the ones around us who are being hurt, injured, in pain, or wounded. Or in the old days, the ones who are being eaten. That's right. The lions. And so we're constantly in this tug of war. And I think we see a lot of it playing out before our very eyes in these kind of tumultuous times we're in right now. Um, I can't see. And bring it towards you. I'm going to bring it towards me. There's this is no, my. There's no shame in this. This is my paper, which has my things. I'm winging it, but you know, Christina is, is a teacher. Fear has the advantage over empathy. It's kind of like having a struggle, like a like a wrestling match between Dwayne the Rock Johnson and Pee Wee Herman. I love that. You know, it's just one is far outstripping the other. So now, why do you think this is? Because I have a theory myself. Well, let's hear your theory. Because at the end of the day. Our survival instinct cares about us, us, the individual, surviving first. Because we want our personal DNA, which I think is BS, but whatever, that's evolution. We want our personal B DNA to survive more than we want. Like, I want my DNA supposedly to survive more than I want Christina's to survive. So I fear so. will outweigh empathy because I'm going to save me before I'm going to save Christina. Well, now I know where I stand. Let's talk about where fear is enacted. It's acted in the amygdala. The amygdala, by the way, is is a piece, part of the brain that I, it really annoys me. <laughs> I'm that? serious. Yeah, because it's the amygdala that often will create fear, will create anxiety, neuroses, like a lot of the negative stuff, sadly, comes mm -hmm. from the amygdala. The thing is, the more you know about how you're wired, the more you can start to look at how to work with that wiring. And what's activating our amygdalas now are things that are seen as other, things that are seen as different. Different is seen as scary. Scary is fear. Fear is amygdala. Amygdala is fight or flight. Boom. You actually just told me a story today, and I've heard of these similar stories, where 
people, I think again from fear, feel entitled not to wear a mask. I work in a library, for example, and I have to wear a mask in a library because that's the rule. So even though I'm conflicted about whether masks work or not, I feel that the right thing to do to quell others' fear, frankly, is to wear a mask. So I'm okay with that. And then you hear these crazy stories, not only do they not wear masks, but someone asks them to put a mask on and they spit on them or they cough in their face. It's like, what? Fear makes you do these irrational, wacky things. Mm -hmm. And it often makes you lash out at others and really hurt them, even though they don't deserve it. And I think if you were, I'm going to say in your right mind, because I think fear hijacks your frontal cortex and makes you not in your right mind, you wouldn't behave this way. The social contract is, if I am protecting you by covering my face holes, then you should wear your mask and protect me by covering your face holes. The science behind it is we are protecting each other from the things that come out our face holes. And if enough people cover their face holes, then there's a lot less bacteria floating around. I think for you and I, I guess I'll just speak for me, it's hard for me to have empathy for someone not only refusing to wear a mask when they're asked to, just because, you know, I don't know for sure the science, so I could be wrong, and I acknowledge that. But also, why would you purposely cough in someone's face or spit on them? Honestly, I don't get it, except for that they're very fearful and probably also unhappy. But the fear is probably driving that, too. But that's my point. All the bad choices we make comes from fear. You know, I lived in Japan for almost nine years. Masks were worn very commonly by all ages. You have a cold, you wear a mask. If you're in a place where a lot of people have colds, you wear a mask to protect you. You have allergies and pollens in the air, you wear a mask. Masks are not taboo and they're not seen as stomping on anybody's freedom. They're just a thing like Q-tips and Kleenex and, you know, things like that. Sunglasses. They're protective things. Are there anything else you want to suggest today about how to disempower your fear so you can empower your empathy? Well. You know, I, I think it's, there are many steps involved in really disempowering fear in a face-to-face -face confrontation. And before you can start disempowering your fear, you have to make sure you're safe. And part of that is being able to disengage from the conflict. Being able to find a way to disengage can be as simple as making sure your mouth is shut and physically stepping back. But the first step is not to engage this, because lots of times this is what gets us in trouble. Also, I think, and again, this is hard, but I think Christine is totally right. I know I have trouble sometimes. If I don't catch my fear quick enough, if I don't feel the, the, the in my case, it's in my chest, the tightening of my chest or the dread. If I don't catch it quick enough and it moves into anger, which is often where fear goes, and I get triggered and I start, it can be an hour or two that I've lost before I, oh my God, I need to disengage. Or I start to cry and then the other person sometimes disengages. But the more we get in touch with our bodies, the more that you ground with your body first, because you're going to feel fear physically before you realize mm -hmm. it up here. So the more you can teach yourself to take the tightness in your chest, or if your stomach's churning a little, or you feel tingling in your fingers. I mean, it's all kinds of ways fear can manifest itself physically. The, the more often you practice tuning into that quickly, the quicker you can close your mouth and walk away. Mm -hmm. And then you can ask yourself when you calm down, why am I getting so upset about this in the first place? And is it really more about something with me that I haven't dealt with yet? Or maybe the person is just, you know, not someone you should be engaging with mm -hmm. for whatever reason. Question you can always ask yourself, if you, can, you know, whenever you can catch yourself, even if it's two hours into a conflict because you just didn't catch it quick enough, is this worth my peace? Is it worth my peace of mind? Because here's the other thing, guys, about fear. That, this is what scares me about fear the most, actually is that it's actually bad for your health. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, ironically, it thinks it's saving you, mm -hmm. but if you do fight or flight over and over again, it actually slowly kills you. It may be that you will be able to be one of those people who could help bring about within your community, however big it is, you know, moments of clarity and be the, the calm voice and the mediating voice. And really create more peace in the world, as yeah. corny as that sounds. Yeah.
And I think that's a lovely thing for a life to do. You know, I think it's a lovely way to spend one's life is trying to use your skills and your empathy and your compassion to, as we like to say a lot, you know, leave this world a little better than when you found it. And I think that's, that's the highest task we have. I agree. Shall we end on that note? I think so. Um, we have been so flummoxed by actually doing this in person today. <laughs> yeah. We don't have any wrecks today, but I think we gave you plenty to chew on. And if you have other suggestions or ideas, because we're not perfect. And Downstairs. We yeah, we would love to hear how you disengage or how you handle um, these kinds of things. If you've been in a situation with a Karen or a Becky or whomever, and you've intervened, we'd love to hear your story and, and maybe even share it with your permission. So please communicate in the downstairs. Thank you so much, and we will see you next time. One, two, two three. three. Disempower fear. fear. Boom. Boom. Just being around you makes me laugh. I'm not know. doing anything. I don't know why. Left a good job in the city. <laughs> Can't you see it? <laughs> More about the man every night and day. <laughs> it's her <your> dress. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> it's her dress. Rolling, 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 rolling on the river. river. Looks like. I don't know what the hell's in our face. It's square. <laughs> you always make me laugh.